you can now hear Movie Heaven, Movie Hell on Stitcher. Stitcher is radio on demand. Listen anytime, anywhere. Stitcher is an award-winning free app that lets you listen to all your favorite shows, plus discover from 20,000 news, entertainment, and sports shows. You can also create your own custom playlists. Stitcher is available on iOS, Android, Nook, iPad, and in over 4 million car dashboards. It's on demand and it's on the go. No downloading, no syncing, no wasted memory. You can stream your favorite podcasts from Stitcher. Don't have Stitcher? Download it free today at stitcher.com or in the App Store. And please leave us a review and rating on Stitcher. Thank you. Welcome to Movie Heaven, Movie Hell with me, Simon Aiken, and... And I'm Keith Isles, and we are both independent filmmakers that like to talk about other film directors' work, and we're currently on our first pass of going through A to Z of filmmakers, both past and present. We are indeed, and we are getting so close to the end of this first pass, it's silly. <laughs> <laughs> we're in, like, the final stretch. Indeed. The end is nigh and then it starts all over again. Yay! Yes. <laughs> Back to A. Indeed. <laughs> so, yeah, we're um, going to talk about a director. I think I think most people uh, has seen his work, but uh, probably doesn't don't really know who he is. Yeah, I think that's a fair thing to say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the director we're going to talk about is uh, Ron Underwood. Yeah, Ron Underwood. Yeah. Um, I, I think just looking at his filmography, it seems that, uh, you know, he did feature films up until sort of the early to mid noughties. But since then, he's really sort of become a director for hire in TV land. And he's sort of done everything from Heroes to Grey's Anatomy to most recently um, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So uh, so he's doing his stuff. He's still working out there, but he does seem to have... Um, seem to have fallen from the the sort of feature films mantle and uh well that there, there may well be a reason for that which i'm sure we'll come on to <laughs> well this is the thing um i mean he comes out swinging with tremors and then goes and makes city slickers now both of those films have had sequels indeed yes and in the case of tremors it's had a lot of sequels indeed i think they they're up to there have been five i believe yeah <laughs> plus yeah. a spin-off television series <laughs> and the tv series yeah <laughs> all of which yeah. are, are related so uh yeah so um big franchise stuff early in his career and then um yeah <laughs> and then not so much after is after that but you know he's still there he's still out there in hollywood um directing so uh what is he now looking on looking on wikipedia apparently he's 62 nowadays wow. and he's still out okay. there doing um uh well you know agents of shield is, is very current so uh so good on him i guess <laughs> well he used to do um from reading his bio on imdb he used to do a lot of um like uh children's t television and stuff like that mm -hmm. you know uh doing a lot of educational films and you know as let's say children's tv and then and then he makes his uh feature debut doing tremors and that was like that is really cool i mean obviously um well i believe he's the uh the writer of tremors as well so uh, yeah i think so uh, yes yes yeah. he is and so I, I don't know if if it was the writing that got him the job I think that's probably what it was, um, but it's it's a it's a hell of a you know a way of starting because um, Tremors is uh, is is such a fun film. It is indeed, yeah, no, absolutely. So, uh, well, that being the case, do you do you want to start there and you go first this time? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> it, seems, it, seems, it seems to make sense as we're there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Simon, what is your pick for movie heaven? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Well, my pick for movie heaven is Hearts and Souls. No, I mean Tremors. <laughs> So this was uh, this was what 1990, I believe. 1990, yes, yeah. that's correct. I have to admit, this is one of those films that I um, I caught on on video. It was uh, it was one of those ones that definitely I, I saw on VHS back in the day. It was a rented um, title and didn't actually get to see this one uh, on the big screen personally. I have to say, I've I've never seen any of his work on the big screen. It's always been on video, and uh, I I actually saw um, City Slickers before I saw Tremors. Mm-hmm. So um, I must have seen it um, probably I think ninety four ninety five when I saw it. Okay. And I know it's definitely I saw it on VHS. But it's one of those films that whenever it's on TV or um, or when it came on Netflix recently, I had to watch it because yeah. it just it's so enjoyable. And I think what works really well is the central relationship between um, Kevin Bacon and Fred Ward. And Fred Ward, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> saving me. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I, I watched it obviously recently again on Netflix yeah. for this for this podcast, and I probably hadn't seen it since I saw it years ago, whenever that was on um, on VHS. And and you're right. I mean, uh, you, you know, obviously Kevin Bacon now, uh, you, you know, gone on to, uh, you know, had a ma- massive career and gone on to to, to many things. But um, yeah. Um, definitely that that sort of central relationship of um his character uh valentine mckee and uh earl bassett played by by fred ward um yeah is 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 a lot of the fun of this i mean this is this is very much a you know it's it's a monster film but it's it's a very light-hearted monster film isn't it it's it's kind of that sort of monster comedy type uh genre sub-genre i would say yeah and and the uh the creatures the graboids are, are very well designed i mean the whole idea of the, them being underneath the uh the ground and they come up and grab you and it's it's all to do with uh sound that they hear you and um and i remember when i first saw that it reminded me of this film called um uh blood beach oh where it was in the sand yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. when they uh, people would get actually sucked underneath and uh it, I, I can't i, I ha, it's been ages since i've seen blood beach so i can't remember if it was actually something under the sand or if it actually was the beach that was killing people can't remember i can't remember so, okay no, I, don't no I can't remember either. <laughs> <laughs> but no it was um i mean the idea of the uh these sort of they're, they're like giant worms um, not the scale of the worms in June, but close enough. Yeah, I mean there is a similarity, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, but um, these creatures, they they've got these. Um, they're like snakes that grab you. They're you know, what they do is they come out the ground, and either they'll swallow you whole, or these sort of tentacles that come out of its mouth grab you and you know drag you back in. And uh, hence why they're called graboids. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think I read, I don't know where it was actually, probably on IMDb, some trivia that that um, an early design of it um, didn't have the multiple sort of tentacles and heads that came out, but but one sort of big head that came out. But apparently it, that they decided to go another way because it was deemed to look somewhat phallic. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and and it had been used in another film, another series of film, you know, ones that we never really ever mention on this podcast. Indeed, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and interestingly, this, this had actually been, um, this was produced by Gail Ann Hurd, uh, wasn't it? This first film, I believe. The first one in the uh, franchise. Uh, I'll tell you. Uh, yes, but she's a executive producer. So right. The other alien connection is Tom Woodruff Jr. That's who, right. Uh, with with his team built the graboids and actually played one of them. This you know that's one of the things that works about this film is mm. is the actual 
again, you know, we're, we're talking sort of pre the days of um, uh, CGI and things of that nature. So uh, yeah. the actual the actual visual effects, um, uh, you know, and the They're special all done effects practically. Are, yeah. are practical and, and they do. They, they look pretty good. Um, it, you know, in this for, for what they are. And uh, again, um, Ron Underwood kind of employs a little bit like, uh, you know, obviously Spielberg did with Jaws um, yes. to sometimes use the, uh, the, 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 the low angle camera um, showing the, the, you know, the sort of point of view movement of the actual um, creatures rather than than showing everything. And that works rather nice in this, actually. It does. But it's kind of funny because um, as in like, well, with Jaws, when it was point of view, it was under the water. So, you know, it was definitely point of view. But with this, it, as you say, it's a low angle uh, just above the ground. <laughs> so it, it's not really the point of view of the creatures because they're underground. It gives you the idea, doesn't it? It gives you the idea. It's, it works very well. But it is, when you think about it, though, you kind of going well. That can't be point of view. They're being they're not being chased by a graboid. They're being chased by a cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I'm, I must confess, I've not seen um, any of the other films in the franchise because I think there's there's three sequels, a prequel, and then obviously the television series. But yes, they're, they're all connected because it, it basically th this film sounded like it. Uh, continued the career for for actor michael gross once um once family ties finished and he stopped playing uh michael j fox's dad he, he went on to have a uh you know a fruitful c career with the uh with the tremors franchise <laughs> yes he did um so uh, you have michael gross playing uh burt gummer and you've got the country and western star reba mcintyre playing his wife heather who actually does a song at the end and um it's kind of funny because I, I have seen um the entire film series and i have seen the tv series as well oh, right. which were they were really good i mean not as good as the original but it did seem to be a case of uh, less and less of the cast would come back <laughs> uh, so with the sequel you had fred ward and michael gross and then uh, for the third one, you had Michael Gross. But then you did have some of the original actors from the first Tremors. So you had um, Ariana Richards, who played the little girl, who was also in Jurassic Park, come back. Uh, you had uh, Tony Gennaro, who played Miguel. He came back. You had Charlotte Stewart, who was uh, the mother, come back. And you also had Robert Jane who uh, played Melvin, and he came back. Oh, right. And it was funny, because they sort of showed you, sort of, because I think about five to ten years had taken place between these, you know, the first film and the third film. So a lot of growing, growing up had happened. And they did turn Melvin into a, an estate agent that was trying to, um, like, gentrify the valley, <laughs> you know, bring these new homes and stuff. So he was still a little shit. Uh, just that he was in it as an, an adult form. Oh, right. And then, of course, the, then you had uh, that third film then led into the TV series. And it was mostly to do with the fact that you had um, uh, this one graboid that was white. It was an albino graboid. And OK, I, I have to explain a little bit because you've not seen them. But uh, with each sequel, um, there was a new kind of evolution in the graboid. Uh, biology so it, it seems that the the worm is the first part of it the second part is a um oh god what is it called well a creature come emerges out of its stomach and it it, it attacks people by seeing its heat okay and then there's a third version of that called an arse blaster <laughs> Which there is a similar version to this creature, but they it flies. It uses um, it uses it, it uses its farts to fly. <laughs> so <what I> okay. <laughs> and so that we so you had that version turn up in the third one, and then um, the fourth one was a prequel. So it was just back to the normal graboid, but it was in Western times, and uh, Michael Gross was in that playing. Uh, 
I guess Bert Gummer's great 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 grandfather. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then the last one, uh, the fifth one, um, it takes place in South Africa, and in the it completes the sort of biological circles, showing that the um, the ass blasters actually has uh, an egg inside it which then gives birth to a graboid so the idea is that it it goes from you know from being a graboid to being the second one and then being an ass blaster so able to sort of fly out great distances and then it lays an egg that becomes a graboid and it just all starts again so so in terms of a a, a franchise then it sounds like in in terms of continuity and everything the it, it works quite well as a series i think you would really enjoy it for that point of view that um they never sort of discount anything that's happened and it just it kind of builds on each one i mean quality wise and money wise they get less and less you can see the budgets getting less and less um though the nice touch with the last film that came out was that uh but gummer found out he had a son oh right okay son of <laughs> that's always the way it... yeah but it wasn't it wasn't from his wife though this was uh some illicit affair he had in atlanta right okay uh, so, and not all of these stories then take place in perfection Nevada. Some of them, you said, go go further afield, yeah? Yeah. The, okay. um, the only ones that take place in perfection is the first one, the third one, and the TV series. Right, right. Okay. I th I'm not sure. If the, uh, it's been a while since I've seen the prequel. The prequel might have been perfection as well. Mm -hmm. But I, I never wasn't a big fan of the prequel. Okay. It just, yeah. Um. So yeah, it's it, it's well worth checking out. I mean, it's it's fun. I, I think it's quite fun. It's the third one's especially fun to see the actors who were in the original one who come back, sort of all sort of a bit more grown up. I d I don't know why I didn't get round to watching it. I mean, I'm, I'm not too sure. Maybe it was just a little bit sort of horror light for me. But um, but I did enjoy this this first film. So uh, hey, maybe maybe at some point I'll. Uh... I'll, I'll check some of the others out, um, you know, <laughs> add it to that extremely ever-growing list. But uh, obviously, if they remade this or rebooted it now, no doubt they would achieve all this with, with, with CGI, I'm guessing, CGI creatures. But then saying that, saying that, there is seems to be a renaissance with practical effects. Yes. I f what with uh, Star Wars, you know, showing that you can... You can do practical effects and just, you know, augment them with CGI. Because I think that film was quite successful with its practical effects. So when they had a CGI character in there, it stood out like a, a sore thumb. Yeah. No, it's good. It, it, is, it is a very entertaining film. And as I said, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's good to see some sort of early Kevin Bacon. Um, you know, so used, <laughs> so used to seeing him on things like The Following and whatever nowadays. <laughs> it's like, yeah, oh, there, yeah. there he is. There he is as a young man. So, uh, <laughs> and you just realise, my God, he has spent practically his whole life on screen. <laughs> mm. Lucky him. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, it, it, it is good. It's, it's Like I said, it's, it doesn't take itself too seriously. No. But at the same no. time... Um, you, you, you know, Ron Underwood, I think, does quite a good job of, of, of building tension, um, you, you know, when it's needed in the in the right places. Oh, indeed. I mean, um, I mean, we mentioned some of the actors before, but we also got uh, Victor Wong in there from um, Big Trouble in Little China. And he's great as the um, he's the convenience store owner. Yes. And he's he's the one who's always trying to sort of make money out of stuff like um, they uh they are able to get one of these uh, graboid tentacles and he buys it off um, Valentine and Earl. And uh, of course, then he starts making money off it by getting people to have their photograph taken with it. And of course, he's the one who comes up with graboid as the name. But uh, yeah, no, but his death was quite, oh, that was horrific. Yeah, I mean, there were bits of it that were pretty nasty, actually. And yeah. um, uh, I think I read somewhere that the film generally got slightly toned down to get a, a more broad certificate like we like we discussed before with these things um yeah. uh, i know i know i know it was edited for language for sure um 
but whether or not that was uh, that was changed on, on the sort of gore side of things as well, I'm not sure. But uh... um, I don't know. I mean, if it has, it, it hasn't hurt the film because it it there didn't seem to be anything that I've seen that makes me think there's something missing. I think that they did a really good balance with the gore and the sort of comedy. They, it, it, it's you know, I mean, you see body parts, but you don't see you know like people being cut to shreds and all this kind of stuff. You just you just sort of, you know, you see people being grabbed and taken under. I mean, the the bit with um, the husband and wife who are up on the hill, they're trying to build their uh, house up there. Mm-hmm. And the girl, the woman gets sucked under in the car. Yes, it was just yeah. great. Just seeing the headlights That's up in right. the sky, and yeah, then that, you see him go. That was Bibi Besh, wasn't it? The actress who uh, who got sucked under in the car. Oh yes, that's right. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, uh, no, that 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 was really well done. Absolutely, where they where it gets pulled, and you that's that's quite a nice shot where the headlights are you know shining up into the night sky. And uh, uh, the other bit I like is when it when it chases them along. Um, and in front of the actual shop front, and you see all of the wooden planks that are making up the uh, the walkway. Um, you, you know, sort of flying in the air just behind them. I mean, obviously, you, you know, you know, a fairly a fairly standard practical effect, but it, it worked quite well in the context of the actual um, chase scene. You know, <laughs> it, it did. It did indeed. I mean, it's um, it's. it's 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 really well done. I mean, as for one second, you, you're not sort of taken out of it. Now, I mean, we haven't really sp- spoken about the story, so I'll just quickly, quickly sum it up. But the, the story is that Valentine and Earl are these two handymen who work in perfection. And um, they decide after a, you know, particularly hard day of work that they, they're going to leave. And the thing that keeps happening is, Every time they head out, they keep getting stopped. They get stopped the first time when they see this guy up on a, um, a power pylon, you know, and he's he, he's literally, he's been up there so long, he's died from dehydration. And then they, they, they go, they, they bring the body back and then they go out again. And then they don't get as far. And each time... They, they just you know they're getting more and more stuck in this town <laughs> as the uh grab boys head towards um the uh the town itself and uh so yeah it's up to these two guys to sort of um come up with a way of trying to save everybody and to um you know to to kill these creatures yeah i mean along with the uh the leading lady that they meet who's um, conducting seismic tests in the area um, uh, who they, who they run across on one of the adventures and, and she kind of ends up uh, joining them. And, and, it, and it is good because they kind of get cut off from civilization um, by these graboids and they're, they're sort of uh, stuck in the middle of this very small town, um, you know, having to sort of, you know hide out on the roofs of buildings um and not make any noise because because you're absolutely right that thing about the uh, them as the title suggests um you, you know uh picking up on the tremors is great mm. in fact one of the scenes that works really well they, they when they sort of st- established the community at the beginning um one, one of the uh one of the residents has a, a daughter who um likes to listen to a walkman whilst going yeah. along on her pogo stick. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, that would be uh, Ariana Richards who played Mindy. That, that, that's quite an effective, uh, uh, effective the way that works, you know, with um, with her doing that, but at the same time yeah. listening to music <laughs> so being completely oblivious to the the world around her. <laughs> and it's, you know, it, it's, it's nicely paced because you kind of learn at the same time as they do what these creatures are because it's not revealed straight away. So you, you you learn as the characters do. I mean, you do see some of the attacks before they actually come across them, but um, but you, you don't see what attacked them. 
you're you're very much with those characters absolutely so yeah and i i, I take it kevin having not seen any of the sequels but i'm pretty certain Ke- kevin bacon's character doesn't come back I, I, at all no kevin bacon doesn't come back um <laughs> he goes off to bigger and better things yeah <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah well fred ward is the only uh one who comes back and he only comes back for the sequel and then after that it it belongs to michael gross yeah who you know, Bert Gummer is a really fun character, <laughs> but he's kind of like this weapons. He's well, he's scary, a survivalist, yeah, isn't he? Scary survivalist type character, but uh, but yeah, just the sort of person you want <laughs> in, in in a crisis such as this. So uh, yeah, yeah, he works quite well, and and clearly has a lot of fun with the character. Uh, yes, at least in that first film. Oh, in does. all the films. So yeah, in all the films. He he does carry all those films he his character does become the tremor series right and it's it's one of the things that makes that uh, the tv series and the sequels enjoyable is his character so you know i'm very happy that he decided to continue on doing it <laughs> well i mean for, for 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 him as an actor it couldn't have been better timing because you know he got tremors literally after family ties had just finished which obviously itself was a long-running show and um uh you, you know obviously michael j fox had gone off to, to to stardom at that point and um and then got this you know and in, in to spawn that many sequels and a series i mean that's that's uh that, that that's 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 a good good money and good career for an actor if if, if you're lucky enough to get it so um yeah i'm sure uh I'm I'm sure it worked out really nicely for him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Are, are there, is this one of those films? Because it seems like at the moment uh, there are plans to sort of remake or reboot every, anything and everything. Is is is? Do you know if there's plans for this to be resurrected? I don't know how long ago the last one was. Um, well, the last one wasn't that long ago. Oh, okay. um, I believe it came out last year. Oh really? That soon? Shit. Okay. Yeah. 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 Let me just double check that. Because the because uh, the TV I... show was at least a decade ago, wasn't? Oh it? yeah. 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 So the movies but... have have come again since the the TV show then. Yeah. I... Well, it, it's yeah. Um. Yeah. So Tremors Five Bloodlines came out on video in 2015. So... Wow. Okay. Yeah. So that it's it's still a current franchise then. Though. But the thing was, the last one before that, the prequel was uh, two thousand four. Right. Okay. So there'd been a fair bit of time, but uh... yeah, yeah. Hmm. But very good. <laughs> and uh, you, you know, uh, obviously, it all started with Ron Underwood. You're right. I've been looking up since you said, and he did. He well, he co-wrote the story. And then they yeah. brought a couple of guys in to do the actual screenplay. So, um, so yeah, yeah, the idea uh, it seems, or at least the nucleus of it, did come from him. Indeed. Well, let's uh, move on to your pick, uh, Keith. All right. Well, my my pick is uh, I've I've actually gone for the very next film he did, which was um, uh, the aforementioned C- City Slickers, which was made in. 91 um which is a basically a sort of comedy west modern day or modern day for the time a contemporary um comedy western uh starring billy crystal daniel stern bruno kirby and jack palance before you continue did you know that this is a remake no i didn't i had no idea it was a remake it is a remake oh. or reimagining of a film a john wayne film called the cowboys God, I usually do my homework and I didn't know that. So, oh, yeah, I can see a bit here that's saying on thingy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's to be similar to the John Wayne's The Cowboys. Yeah, I don't think it was supposed to be an actual remake, but it's it's a similar idea. Yeah. Well, what it is is that um, in the John Wayne film, uh, he takes out a group of um, of young cowboys out to on a, a cattle drive. And of course, he dies. Sorry, spoilers, but and they have to continue on with him. And the lovely thing they did with City Slickers was that they took, you know, um, these three guys who are kind of going it through a midlife crisis and yeah. does a similar thing with them. 
Yeah. Okay. No, that's that's cool. So they they, they sort of took an idea and and, and yeah. turned it on its head slightly and 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 came up with this. Which uh, now I was trying to remember. I was trying to go back through my uh, memory lane and <laughs> try and remember. I don't know whether I saw the original one at the cinema or whether it was the sequel I saw at the cinema because there was a, a sequel to this which um, wasn't as good. Um, yeah. But, but, but yeah. took most of the most of the same cast again um but th this this film itself um you know the original or this city slickers uh i i remember thoroughly enjoying um it, it's one of those films you know that that's that's very much a feel-good movie um but it's also it works really well it's really nicely paced um it's very well acted and the, the script itself is, is, is very good. Um, I mean, I remember at the time, God, this revisiting it, this made me feel so old because <laughs> I remember at the time in the story, even though the actors themselves were slightly older than this, in the story, they, they haven't yet reached, reached 40, they're 39, yeah? Um, and uh, I remember at the time, um, you, you know, when I saw this, I thought that was so bloody old. And <laughs> here we are now, and it's in the rearview mirror, sadly. So I'm like, oh dear. But um... you, 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 you were weirded out. I was weirded out because I'm watching it, and I am 39. And I'm thinking, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, this is just a, a bit too close for comfort. But saying that. I don't feel the same way as these guys do. Well, thank God. Well, I think I think yeah, we're talking. Uh, you know, this was ninety one, and here we are in two thousand and sixteen. So, like we're always saying, it's uh, the demographics have all changed, and uh, mm. you know, for, forty is the new thirty, or whatever it's supposed to be. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think it's. <laughs> I, th I think uh, yeah. I mean, you know, definitely at this point, um, it was the whole midlife crisis thing for these guys, and. Uh, you know, um, we've got uh, Billy Crystal, who uh, playing a character called Mitch Robbins. And uh, yeah, he's he works in advertising and uh, he really he really is starting to feel that his life. In fact, the script's really well written. because I remember some of the comedy in this I particularly liked. He, he had that mm. bit where he's going about he's losing his hair where he wants it and growing it oh, where he God, doesn't. Yeah. And he, he talks about the hair on his back and makes the whole seth brundle fly um joke. Yeah. And I, I, I always like it when they throw a movie joke in there particularly if it's a movie i like <laughs> so uh, so are you saying that you've read the script uh no no, no I'm, I'm saying i think it's a good oh script. okay because yeah. i have to say i i did get the feeling that a lot of the stuff in it was being uh, improvised by crystal and Daniel Stern and Bruno Kirby. Yeah, yeah. It was a certain, I mean, especially that, because he does that thing where he goes, hello. Yeah, yeah. A lot. And I don't, I can't see that in a script. No. I, I'm, I'm, I know they did it in the second one because, oh my God, did it, they do that so much in the second one. I have to say, uh, for this, I went back and I watched the second oh, one. Oh, did you? And, okay. Oh my God. God, is it fucking awful! But it's got your your friend John Lovitz in the in the <laughs> second one, hasn't it? Replacing Bruno Kirby, um, yeah, playing a different character. But yeah. so you, you have that for a start. But it's as with the, the the script and the characters in the first one, they cause, they kind of shine. Yeah, the, especially the three main actors in it. You would love to spend time with these guys because just you know when they're talking about stuff and. They're the kind of conversations you would have with your friends. Yeah, yeah. Even the sort of deep personal ones. And and also the fact that, you know, they take the mickey out of um, Daniel Stern, who has an illicit affair with the one of his checkout girls. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I mean... Yes, yeah, a, very, a very awkward scene. Oh, by the way, uh, you were saying about John Lovitz, right? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, when I go and visit my parents... Um, they like to watch the uh, and I watch it with them. The the reimagined Hawaii Five O. Yeah, you know, oh, okay. my dad was always a fan of the original, and we watched the reimag reimagining. And um, uh, John Lovitz has turned up as a character in that on just in a couple of episodes. But it made me laugh. It made me laugh because of your comment 
like when was the last good thing John Lovitz did? And then, like, literally a week later, I'm watching an episode of Hawaii Five O, and there he is. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's hilarious. Ah, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but it's only a guest. Indeed, guest he was a part. guest. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but no, uh, definitely the chemistry between uh, Billy Crystal, Daniel Stern, and Bruno Kirby in this is is absolutely fantastic. Um, I mean, uh, you, you know, the, the conversations they have, whether they're they're actually serious and, and, and slightly heartfelt or, or, or just plain ridiculous uh, work. And in mm. fact, one of the things that really cracked me up in this is when they're trying to explain to Daniel Stern's character how, <laughs> how he can, on, it, on his VHS video <laughs> recorder, he can record one channel whilst watching the other and he just cannot get his head around it at all. I thought that was well, I like amazing. what uh, Bruno Kirby <laughs> says. He says, the cows could do <laughs> could yeah. set to record the VHS. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, but you know, these, these guys all decide. I mean, I have to say, um, uh, P- P- Patricia Wettick plays um, uh, Barbara Robbins, who's Billy Crystal's character's wife in this film. And uh, yeah. he's got an incredibly easygoing missus, actually, that she mm. just kind of sees how sort of depressed he is about getting older and uh, totally um, agrees to let him go uh, go on this 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 trip with his mates and um uh but but so they go to play cowboy for for a few weeks also uh, a bit of interest in trivia this is actually the and again god this makes me feel totally old is is this was jake gyllenhaal's first screen appearance as a 10 year old yeah. <laughs> playing play, playing billy crystal's son when he goes to the uh the school to uh to talk to the class <laughs> so. well i mean this is the thing i'd um i remember um i've, I've watched this i had watched it just before watching this again for the podcast and uh that was the thing that sort of jumped out at me was like bloody hell that's scary it's jake gyllenhaal and he's 10 yeah i know it's really scary but uh but uh do you know who played the um the daughter i believe that was billy crystal's own daughter was it that's correct, yeah. Lindsay Crystal. Oh, right. I don't know whether she went um, on to do anything else or not. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if you spotted her, but there was also a very young Danielle Harris as well. Yeah, I seen that in the credits, but I couldn't, I, I didn't actually see, notice her when I was watching the film. Yeah, she has like one question in it. Ah, oh, right. Okay. She's the dark haired girl with the ponytails. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. So there you go. Some some young future future faces in this <laughs> film. Um, yeah. But also, uh, so so yeah. So essentially, the setup for this is they they go out on this um, trip to, uh, to 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 herd cattle and, and become sort of ranchers. So they they get to be basically grown men that, that get to play cowboy <laughs> for for a, for a couple of weeks. And um, you know, it's not just them. They they they're kind of there with the uh, with, with, with a with a motley crew of um mm. uh, of other tourists on this including um oh i forgot the actor's name who's fantastic uh oh yeah david paymer uh plays ira and and josh mostel is barry and they're like a sort of couple of ice they're, they're kind of doing the whole ben and jerry's basically aren't they yeah Barry and Ira, Ben and Jerry, yeah. yeah, very close. Yeah, they're kind of doing that. And then, of course, we've got the lovely Helen Slater in there, um, who was supposed to be meeting a friend, and uh, uh, they that didn't happen. So she's come on the trip on her own. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and who didn't come back for the sequel as well? Yeah, yeah. No, seems really... seems it didn't quite work out with her and Daniel Stern's character. Oh. <laughs> shame because that would have been well good work for daniel stern actually if you could get it you know (laughs) (laughs) and then of course uh you've got um bill henderson and and phil lewis playing doctors ben and steve jessup which uh (laughs) make lots of well they're not doctors they're dentists sorry they're dentists yeah and they make lots of black jokes don't they (laughs) not black jokes but the the thing was when they first meet and uh the the son does go yes and we're black yeah you know trying to make a thing out of it and the 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 father goes they're not making a thing out of it, son. You are. You know, calm down. Yes. Yeah. Which I think was good. I think that was a good line. Abs- absolutely. So, um, so they're there, and then of course they get uh, they get introduced to um, the uh, 
the, the well in fact the introduction is brilliant of of mm. curly washburn who's who's jack palance's character um who's who's one of the uh the ranchers and uh well he's the he is um oh god what is he called um He's he's uh, he's the cattle boss. The cattle boss, indeed. I think it's that's correct. Yeah, I think that's the term. But um, but yeah. I love his introduction because basically you've got two of the, the the ranch hands and they're kind of hitting on um, Helen Slater, I suppose as as you would, but they're doing it in a very disrespectful kind of sleazy way, and yeah. um, you, you know uh, they basically um, Billy Crystal's character sort of steps in to try and sort of just talk his way out of the situation um and uh in steps the mysterious curly who who frightens everyone to death <laughs> <laughs> and then there's this kind of ongoing gag where uh where mitch is is intimidated by this 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 man <laughs> have you killed anybody today and he goes yeah well, the day ain't over. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Very, 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 very nicely done. And actually, um, won a uh, this won an Academy Award for um for Jack Palance in this in this role. So, uh, so you know, Ron Underwood was responsible for a film that uh, that that won an Academy Award. There you go. Yeah, but can I let's let's uh, let's talk about the Academy Awards. Now, was it a case of that it was a uh, an academy it was award winning performance or was it for the fact that they were given the award for his body of work well that's the age old thing isn't it <laughs> yeah you know like we've seen lately with you know with say scorsese winning for the departed yet you know the departed is is an okay film but it's not goodfellows or mean streets or taxi driver you know films that should have won so, I mean, I'm just curious to think, wonder, you know, what your thoughts are on Jack Palance winning. Because it's a good performance. He's not in the film very long. I mean, he does make um, quite a stamp. But Academy Award winning? Well, do you know, I don't know who he was up against that year, to be honest. Um, I mean, that, that, that would have a big, uh, you know, big factor on it and uh if i haven't actually sort of researched that so i i don't know um but uh but this this thing this thing of this thing about awards i mean you know uh <laughs> it, it, it it's it's always very very subjective anyway and um uh y you know some yeah sometimes there there have there have been this thing that are they are they owed a, an award for their body of work rather than for the actual you know, film or the performance itself. But I don't know. I mean, I you know, this was a good performance in this film. As I said, I have no idea what it was up against in uh, in 91. But, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I thought it, I, yeah. I thought he was good, you know. Oh, yeah, no, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that he wasn't good. I'm, you know, he is the most memorable thing of the whole film. Yeah. I mean, especially talking about, you know, the, the secret to life. Well, that's right. Is I mean, just that's, one thing. That, that's that's uh, of all the scenes in the film. I mean, there's a lot of funniness in this film. There's a lot of things that make you laugh and then and they're amusing and fun. But yeah, yeah, the scene where he talks to um, Billy Crystal sort of alone and they talk and and he has this whole thing where he points and he says this, you know, the key to life. And he says, "What your finger?" And he goes, "No, it's you know." It's different for everyone and whatever it is. I mean, that's that's a, a nicely written scene for one and, um, you know, nicely performed. And, uh, you, you know, I know that I know that me and my uh, some of my mates growing up have often quoted that as well. Mm. So it, it, it is it yeah. is very uh, memorable and, 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 you know, quite moving. So and, and that's kind of true, because, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we get we. Mm. We meet so much crap in our lives, you know. We have a job that most people don't like, and you know it. It, it can get quite tough sometimes. But the the idea of there being that one thing, that one thing that you know is worth living for, that one thing that makes you happy, mm -hmm. you know, and it's it's just a wonderful idea. But it's a very truthful idea as well. That you know, for, for some people who are content, they're content for the fact that. There's something in their lives that they're happy to do. Mm -hmm. You know, we, as much as we moan and bitch about 
you know the industry and stuff we we still love making films oh right yeah, yeah so i would say that was our one thing in life it would be would be film. no i agree i mean film people and filmmakers and creative people in general i mean i think it's 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 when it's that thing that's 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 a passion and that you love doing it and uh you know as i as i've often said definitely when teaching and whatever uh to students is you've got to do it because you love it and because you've got a passion for it because if you want it for you know fame success and fortune and things of that nature <laughs> that you know that only happens to a sadly a small percentage and um yeah those are not the reasons to be in it so yeah so yeah i mean i'm i'm totally up with that speech and um very much uh you, you know in terms of the 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 scene in the film i think it works really nicely so um yeah so i mean yeah. th th there's a lot of good things to say about this film i mean um Let's go. What one of the things that's particularly good about it as, as a western is it's got um, beautiful cinematography by Dean Semler, who uh, who, who started off with you know working with um, uh, Miller on on films like Mad Max Two and, and and the sequel Beyond Thunderdome, but also uh, worked with Kevin Costner on one of my favourite films <laughs> ever, which is Dancers of Wolves. So I was going to say that. It's got this one, 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 <laughs> wonderful cinematography, but also a very sort of um, uh, Elmer Bernstein-esque score by Mark Shaman that kind of, uh, you know, hits all the, all, the, all the sort of relevant Western notes and, uh, you, you, know, you know, can be very sort of, uh, you, you know, um, rousing in places. So, you, you know, that all works very well. <laughs> the one thing about the score is that in some places it, there's a sort of weird mix of stuff. It's like the opening, you know, with the opening credits where you have to like the little cartoon character. <laughs> yeah. It's supposedly um, Mitch. Was it Mitchy the Kid? Who they referred <laughs> to him as, you know, this cowboy character when he was younger. And they, I think this cartoon at the beginning is kind of like that. And, um, you know, you, you have this sort of, there isn't one theme playing, there's sort of all these several themes playing. And they do that sometimes in the film as well. And I, I wasn't a big fan of that. I mean, I, I, I love the theme they came up for them. It was very cowboy, you know, when they're bringing the, the herd in and stuff. But then also you've got them doing um, the, the theme tune to Bonanza. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the middle of this, it's just really, it's kind of slightly jarring that the, the music's slightly you know, in places is a bit all over the place. Yeah. Though saying that, the when they do Bonanza, that was just brilliant because, you know, as a kid growing up watching that TV show, you, you know the, the, the theme tune oh, yeah. immediately. Every, every instantly recognisable, absolutely. But, um, you, you know, and of course, I mean, you know, you know the film's got its... The, the film's of its time and it's got it, it, its particular things. Like, of course, you've got to have the... Uh, at the beginning, the, the the sort of montage where they're all trying on their different cowboy hats and outfits until <laughs> yeah. they get it right, and uh, you, you know all, all all of that sort of thing. Um, but but you, you know, I I think I think that uh, they all gel well as as a um, you, you know as characters in this. The actual yeah. storyline and the plot itself is quite interesting. Um, uh, one thing I did notice rewatching it actually, and I and I wonder whether it was. Uh, I remember this was even in the trailer, I think, but I, I don't know whether it was added to be another joke or just added to fix a continuity error or what. But there's there, there's a lovely scene where uh, Curly and Mitch um, they find a, a pregnant cow and and have to deliver the calf, and basically mm -hmm. Curly has to hold the calf down while. Uh, Mitch has to sort of reach in and, um, uh, you, you know, and, and pull out the calf. And of course, there's all yeah. the stuff about, you know, this wasn't in the brochure and, you know, all the jokes. But there's one joke where he says about um, having lost his watch. And those that that particular line looks like it was recreated in a studio. Um, it, it looks like a, a studio sh sort of process shot rather than matching the rest really? of the scene yeah i found that really jarring and i wondered whether it was because in the in the film definitely when he starts and he puts on the gloves he is wearing a watch but once the calf is delivered he hasn't got a watch on and i thought to myself i wonder whether they 
reshot that to A, get another laugh in there and B, cover up a continuity error. Because if you look at it, the lighting, the backdrop, everything, it looks like it was recreated in a studio. It doesn't match the uh, the rest of the scene. And I, I, I was actually pulled out for a second watching that. I was like, whoa, hold on, that's weird. And Ooh, um, okay, I'll have to go back because I've seen it several times and um, usually something like that would jump at me immediately and it didn't, not at mm. all. It's, it's it's really odd. It's like a different mm. different camera angle. It looks it looks uh, it it, do, it doesn't look like it was shot on location at all. It looks like it was oh, picked okay. up somewhere else. And as I said, I don't know whether that was in there because they 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 thought in that scene they needed another joke or whether it was just to cover up the fact that there is there would have been a continuity error otherwise. But uh, I don't know. Or the third thing was that they shot it on the day. And it didn't work. Mm. Yeah, maybe. And so they had to go back and scratch reshoot. on the film. Or because something. at the end of the day, because you know, I think if it was a continuity error, then the the watch would have reappeared. Mm. Yeah. You know, because the rest of the film he doesn't have a watch. No, no. It's, as I said, it's a uh, it, you know, when when you're sort of going, I mean, I'm sure the, the average audience wouldn't have a problem with that at all because it, it works and it's quite amusing and all this. But I did sort of rewatching it. I was like, oh. That, that that looked odd, and uh, I'm gonna have to go back and watch that scene yeah, now because I just, looked... I did not see that. Yeah, fair enough. And I've seen it. I've seen this film a few times, so as I say, something like that usually jumps out. Yeah, but I mean, you, you know, the, the 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 rest of it. I mean, that they they come up against you know the the, the script's very well paced. They come up against problems, etc., as they go along, and you know, leading up to the sort of climax part with the uh well it almost looks like stuff from deliverance all of a sudden when they're in the uh in the rapids you know uh being swept away i would have the, said well, deliverance you know, no not deliverance i mean it's just you're that's normal fare for a cowboy yeah, film i was gonna say you're taking me Come. literally and i don't mean it literally but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know. but no but i mean <laughs> i mean the, uh, the, the you know the crossing a river is like a cliche in oh yeah no, absolutely. i mean it all always happens they always have to find you know like um a shallow part of the water to cross and all that kind of stuff so you know deliverance is completely different i mean if i saw some guys yeah. in canoes Simon, going Simon, past you've misunderstood the way, I, <laughs> yeah. the way I meant it so let's 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 just move on but yeah so um but no i mean that that scene's very well done uh you, you know you, you feel some gen, genuine jeopardy and tension even though you know obviously this being the kind of film it is you know it's you know they're going to be all right and uh you know he's going to rescue the calf and and, and everything's going to be fine so um yeah you know, yeah and, and again you know i said at the beginning about it being a feel-good movie i mean it ends you, you know in a in an uplifting way the character has learned something about himself learned something about life in fact all of them have the three of them the the, the, the three main characters uh, have evolved from this experience uh you know they've had the adventure of a lifetime quite literally and um you, you, you know, it really is a happy ending where they're, they're all in a much better place in their in their individual lives. And uh, we even find that they even rescued the calf, which which is great yeah. because because the one downer in the film is when they <laughs> gotcha. finally get all the cattle back and they find out that, uh, you know, they've herded them across and they're going to be basically taken for, for slaughter for the, to a meat company. And that, that that's kind of a. Oh, what the hell! We've just been through all of that for this, but uh, but at least he managed to rescue the calf. So um, yeah, so so it, end, it <laughs> ends it ends uplifting and and, and amusing and um, you, you know really good. But no, I, I hadn't seen the film in many years. I, I must admit, I didn't go back uh, and and check out the sequel again, uh, which which from from the sounds of what you're saying might might be might be a good thing but uh yeah it's it's it, yeah I, I can see why they went for it but it just it it didn't have the same magic as the as the first film did yeah no I, I, absolutely and i think magic's a good word because i think i think this film does have that i mean for me it's definitely my favorite of uh ron underwood's films you know i find don't get me wrong i find tremors very very enjoyable and think that's a that's a good film also but uh but yeah, th th this one for me uh, always sort of stuck in my memory from when I first saw it. Definitely that thing about, you know, finding 
finding what makes you happy in life and everything was was a real sticker and um yeah i think i think the journey of this was quite fun so this this was not uh, a chore at all to go back and uh and, and revisit and 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 rewatch and uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it that's listening i i you know i i know we've i know we've thrown in a few spoilers in here but um i i i suggest that uh you know if you want to if you want a sort of fun feel good movie you could you could do a lot worse than checking out city slickers and uh and and watching that so good stuff and yes, it, and yes, it's nothing like Deliverance. So that wasn't <laughs> what I meant at all. But <laughs> I love Deliverance, but that's a whole different movie. But yeah, <laughs> it's a whole different it podcast. Is indeed, is indeed. <laughs> but very tonally different and everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but oh, features well. <laughs> <laughs> Not my best comparison, but there you go. <laughs> been a long day yes yeah (laughs) well um after that uh we're um we're gonna do our movie hells um just after these messages so you're making a film horror film meta horror film a horror film about horror film horror film about cinema. And why would you do that? Life is so beautiful. You just have something in your eye. I thought you said you wanted to do something different. Why do the same thing that everyone else is doing? It drives me mad. We all have opinion on everything. Nobody listened to me. Nobody tried to understand anything. Just too much. I found out recently that I had a, a syndrome when I was younger. When I try to go to sleep, the whole world will change. Like everything will go too quick, too slow, too big, too small. I could control it. Benny Loves Killing. Available now on Vimeo and IndieFlix. And if they don't go for it, you will kill them all. Do you like science fiction and fantasy? Do you like things to be rigorously, or rather obsessively, alphabetized? Then do we have the show for you. The A to Z of SFF takes a wry, lightly fictionalized approach to the compulsive breaking over of pop culture artifacts that make up so much of today's podcastosphere. We cover everything from Aaron A. Aardvark to Zardoz, and all points in between. Zardos might be a welcoming mind. We've been at this for a year and we haven't finished the A's yet. The A to Z of SFF, a podcast of epic triviality. Two men, 26 letters, one universe. Search for us on iTunes or your favourite podcast app as the A to Z of SFF. Or check out our website, the A to Z of SFF.com. What's the matter, Jane? It's kind of hard to explain. I can't put my finger on it, but there's definitely something wrong. Jane? I suppose we can't expect her to get over it just like that. You always be past this. So, so bright. It's just the dawn, Jane. You have to take her to the hospital. Have her placed under constant watch. Well, that much I know, but who done it? You don't even try and stop me. You know I'm going to harm you, yet you do nothing. What about that wonderful husband of yours? Oh, Martin. I love him. Well, someone has to die.
Blood and Roses. Available now on Amazon.com. On DVD and video on demand. <laughs> right, so we're back. <laughs> Uh, still God, we're still laughing at the bad deliverance uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well um, it's we <laughs> that's it <laughs> so so after these two uh picks for heaven uh it's kind of like um after he did one more great film which was hearts and souls with robert downey jr it was a really and again a really heartfelt fun film but then after that, it kind of slipped. And uh, so my pick for movie hell is Pluto Nash. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't seen this film until this week. Um, uh, I, I Yeah. <laughs> and I sometimes I feel like I could have done without it in my, in my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I mean, this yes. was kind of the last... No, it wasn't the last film he did, was it? No. no. But uh, this was this was the decline, wasn't it? <laughs> this was kind of like the penultimate film he did before heading off to do TV. Right. Uh, the last film he did before that was Ste- Stealing Sinatra, which I haven't seen, so I have no idea what it's like. Might be a, it might be a, a much better than this film. Mm. Much better. But um, okay, well. Story goes that Eddie Murphy is a chap called Pluto Nash and he's just been released from prison. And of course, the story takes place on the moon, hence why you get like um, the opening and closing tracks of the film is, you know, rip offs of American Wealth in London. They take the whole idea of using songs with the moon in it, but not to such great effect. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and so it, it it's about this, you know, smuggler who's um, started a uh, nightclub and um, this mysterious man wants to um, to buy it up and turn it into a casino because gambling is legal on the moon. And they blow up his bar and of course he wants to find out who was behind, you know, the destruction of his bar and he has um oh god a... it's the android well he has his um android uh bouncer called bruno played by randy quaid and uh rosera rosera dawson in toll and uh and of course he uses his friends and contacts to find out who he was and he's kind of like an, a legend as well on on the moon and of course, um, spoilers, but uh, <laughs> of course, it turns out that the uh, evil mastermind is Eddie Murphy. Yay. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's plays both parts and, uh, you know, much hilarity ensues. Mm. He's, a, he's a, actually a clone of himself because yeah. in, in this in this future where this is set, um, you know, it's established that cloning techniques are. You, you, you know, is established and um, uh, is commonplace, uh, along with androids and you know, you know, intergalactic travel and things of that nature. So uh, yes. <laughs> well, I have to say, I think the world building it was was kind of interesting. I actually thought that the 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 world they actually built around this character was it was kind of you know it was very future noir, very but you know. As if it was, but very brightly lit. I mean, very sort of Batman for it actually very reminded Schumacher. me of Space yeah. Truckers quite a bit in terms of the yeah, really just a bit sort of remind me of that. I was like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> <Yeah>. Sorry, <laughs> make you have to re- relive Space Truckers. Well, you know, I mean, I. I... I like sci-fi and uh, I think I said once before, you know, um, I like things like uh, I'm a big fan of Butt Rogers in the 25th century, which let's be honest, that's that that's kind of cheesy sci-fi. But uh, but yeah, um, obviously, Space Truckers was something else. And uh, and this was something else, although I suppose if I'm being fair about it, 
I found I actually probably found it more more uh, entertaining than than um than, than space truckers, even though it what it, it still is very bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have to say there, there there are some good things about it. I mean, I thought the world building was it was kind of interesting. Um, I I I thought Randy Quaid as Bruno was really mm. good. I actually liked Bruno. Um, but then it was just. Uh, it just felt like a Eddie Murphy vanity project because he was this character who had no flaws. You know, he was literally perfect. I mean, the, the beginning of the film is him walking into this bar. It's really run down and horrible and saving his friends from Burt Young playing a gangster, mm-hmm. you know, from being, well, not killed, but having acid poured down his throat. Yeah which would probably have been a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's kind of, um, you know, it's Eddie Murphy light in so much as, because it's a PG rating, it's not Eddie Murphy effing and blinding. It's it's Eddie Murphy trying to do all of what he does without the effing and blinding. So, uh, it, well, it's just, this is the age of uh, Eddie Murphy and family-friendly Yeah, film. I mean, uh, he he done Doctor Doolittle and the sequel before this, and... It was just sort of that, you know, he just wasn't taking chances anymore, really. No, no. And I mean, you know, it's it's got good actors in it, like you've already mentioned, you know, Randy Quaid and, Quaid and Rosario Dawson. And uh, um, there's, uh, oh, it's well, like Pam. I'll give you a list. Pam Greer. Joe Pantalono. Oh, Pantalono. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Um, you've got Louis Guzman. Yeah. You've got Peter Boyle. Yeah. You've got Pam Greer. Yeah, good to see her crop up in it. Um, yeah. yeah, and you had John, Cleese. and of course John Cleese doing, you know, basically what he does best. <laughs> yeah, being the sort of uh, hologram in in a in a car that they steal. Yeah, British. Yeah. British. Um, yeah, he's he's like the uh, chauffeur. He's like the AI for the car, yeah. and he's like, you know, he's like officer, officer. I've been stolen. I can tell you where they are. <laughs> all this kind of stuff yeah i mean it's it was fun but it's just it's kind of like at the end of the day it was really just forgettable and you know predictable and yeah and as i say he was a character who he just he couldn't do anything wrong you know everybody liked him in some ways he's like a mary sue yeah yeah you know and it just it wasn't interesting so you have a character who you know he can get out of any situation either you know using his brains or using his mouth and it's just you know it just uh it wasn't interesting no i must admit i mean you know for for an adventure film where you know they go on this journey it, it was quite uh dull and i mean it, it was it's one i mean it, in terms of you know it's one god knows how many razzie awards and uh <laughs> it, it, it's it's probably one of the biggest financial losses in movie history because obviously it did have a, a pretty massive budget on this because of I think it was a hundred million dollar budget um because of all the sets and costumes and yeah. world building like you said um but uh and obviously a you know a star cast as well but um you know I think it it it, it didn't even make five million uh, at the box office, so it was no. A massive well, they're they're talking. I mean, I'm just looking at figures now, and uh, yeah, sort of opening weekend, it made two million. Yeah, and of course, um, so, yeah. of course, it's got. But he hated it so much, he didn't even want to be credited. It's got Alec Baldwin in it briefly as well, hasn't it? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> god yeah. But uh, yeah, it's such such a, a memorable uh, character that I've forgotten he was <laughs> in it. <laughs> yeah. No, it, 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 this was this was. I mean, it's only ninety minutes, but it was a. It felt like a long ninety minutes. <laughs> yeah, 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 to be did, honest, and and it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't anything new or. Um, yeah, it, it just wasn't particularly good. I mean, you 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 know there 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 are. It has been done the sort of futuristic adventure chase movies have been, have been done so much better in other films yeah um, but it was it was trying to be a noir film set on the moon and it just it, it was just too colorful was the problem yeah well one of the problems i mean also the, the the script wasn't great i mean there's a whole stupid bit where they're trying to figure out who this 
mystery man is and they go to um this clinic where they can oh god know, that bit's get your awful. body yeah and they, they they have a hologram that shows you your, what your body types could be and ah it just... and yeah and eddie murphy keeps going yeah, on about it just looks Rosario awful dawson hasn't got a big enough ass or whatever he keeps saying doesn't he and it's like yeah oh please come on you've, you've said this joke too many times that's the other thing there was a lot of um repetition of, of, of yes. sort of the same joke and it, oh, was, it God, felt like yeah. panic, i mean quite literally i mean there was was it he had that uh, made robot who just would go oops and then bend over and pick something up so you could see her <laughs> ass yeah i just it does make you wonder how much interference was done on this film if it was say the studio or if it came from eddie murphy i don't know but it there seemed to be a, a, things thrown in there that just didn't seem to work. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It just made the tone really inconsistent. I mean, okay, when I say tone, it wasn't exactly dark or gritty for any point, but apart from the nightclub that he walks into at the beginning, <laughs> that was really nasty. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, the rest of it was just, it was just very light. It was just fun. Yeah. It was forgettable that no, was it was i i agree and um y- you know i was like sort of uh oh you know I, I i found myself just kind of not really engaged with it. it it was just kind of flowing over me um but i was you know my mind was definitely thinking about other stuff so that's never a good sign yeah. is it um yeah. but yeah it, it, it's it's you can sort of see why uh perhaps run and wood's career started to go downhill a little bit you know, after this point with, with films like this, but I mean, you know, the point was he was entrusted with a, with a, with a very high budget movie here. And you can, I mean, to, to, to be fair to it, you can see where the money went because it is on screen, but you know, it's like everything we've talked about this on many a podcast, um, you, you know, script and story in characters are key. And, uh, if that stuff doesn't work, you know, that's, that's the sort of, backbone of the entire uh production mm. if, if that doesn't work then you, you know i think somebody said once you can make a you can make a bad movie out of a good script but you can't make a good movie out of a bad script and and this is kind of the uh a, a shining example of that very quote isn't it <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i just quickly looked up some trivia and it did say that this script was originally written in 1985 and it you know and it took like 17 years to actually get 17 married. years and that's the best they could they could come up with <laughs> well i think it had gone through a lot of writers so yeah. uh, a lot of dilution had gone on but you know a film like that in 1985 might have worked works yeah, yeah quite possibly yeah yeah but then i think it would have been a lot grittier and wouldn't have been sort of written for eddie murphy i mean it certainly was kind of tailor-made for him that part so yeah, I don't know. Did he produce this? I know he produces some of his um, work. I don't know whether this was actually anything to do with him as a producer or not. Uh, does it? No, he's not listed. Mind you, he probably had his name taken off of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. As a producer. But uh, but no, it was just kind of... And funny enough, it wasn't what I was expecting either. I don't know why from the... I, I'd avoided sort of everything about this film over the years and hadn't even yeah. seen a trailer or anything. And from the poster, I thought he was like some sort of superhero in the future. I didn't realize that yeah. what he's wearing is supposed, which now I'm looking at it, it does look obvious now that it is supposed to be sort of a, uh, a you know, an EV suit. Um, but uh, I don't know why, for some reason, I thought it was like some sort of superhero costume or something when I first saw it. And I think it was to do with the title, The Adventures of Pluto Nash, written in that yeah. sort of, uh, you know, superhero type fonts and and i just kind of thought it was something different to to what i ended up seeing anyway but uh but still equally well, as yeah bad. <laughs> well i mean especially in the fact that he you know he had been in a film called um is it meet oh meet dave you know where he's he's like a, he is a ship that's being controlled by little people in his head oh my god yeah okay forgotten about that <laughs> God, it wasn't it wasn't a good time for him back then, was it? Bloody hell! No, no. I, I have to. Well, I mean, though, thankfully Shrek came along, and you know that saved him for quite a bit, and kept him family friendly. 
But uh, yeah, it was kind of, you know, yeah, it's another film I've seen now, but it's one that if somebody asked me what it's about in six months time, I probably wouldn't even be able to tell you because I'm sure it's going to get erased. I couldn't remember the plot of this when uh, I picked it. I literally had to go back and watch it just to jog my memory because it is kind of, as I say, very forgettable. And uh, you know what? Probably not worth your time at all. Just just skip it. Yeah, I must admit, again, it's it's not my kind of sci-fi, you know. Um, yeah, I didn't really... This, this didn't really do anything for me. But... Uh, but yeah, I can certainly see why you picked it. <laughs> We're in agreement, uh, you know, yeah. on, on that one at least. So, uh, oh, all right. let's move on because I can't think no. of anything else to say about this film. Fair really. enough. Okay. Well, well, my one um, again, you know, Ron Underwood doesn't have a massive filmography, even though he's got quite a lot of directing credits. You know, you know, quite a lot of them are, are television um, related. So. In terms of his movie credits, I was sort of, I hadn't seen everything. Um, obviously, I hadn't seen Adventures of Pluto Nash at that point, And uh, that would have definitely been, um, you know, if, if I was going to do an obvious pick for, for, for movie hell, it would have been that. I saw that he'd done a film with a starring Usher called In the Mix, but I wasn't actually able to find that. To, uh, yeah, to check out I'm sure yeah. you know I mean that sounds like that had the potential to be pretty bad <laughs> so what 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 I ended up picking and watching because I hadn't seen it since it was out um and I feel a bit bad ragging on it but it but it does have its problems I picked uh Mighty Joe Young that he made in 1998 um I think really that the, the, the if I had to sort of summarize before we go into any detail what the problem or what my problem is with this film uh, particularly is, it's just that this is a Disney film and it's a very family friendly kind of typical model Disney film. And I think that's kind of what let it down a little bit for me. Um, you know, it, it became very sort of, formulaic and and uh, predictable and a little too light for the subject matter in some respects um but it is it's very loosely based on the 1949 film uh mighty joe young which uh, ray harryhausen did the the effects on it was kind of a it was kind of following up on the success of of, of king kong um you, you know you know uh, the king kong movies and uh yeah, this is sort of loosely based on on, on the same story. Uh, it's even got, which which I thought was a little bit on the nose and cringeworthy. You've got a uh, a cameo by Ray Harryhausen, but also Terry Moore, who played the equivalent that um, that Charlize Theron's playing in this film. And they they make some sort of comment at a party about, oh, who's that girl? Oh, I don't know. She looks familiar. And it was a little bit oh. like. Ooh. It was a little oh. bit. It was a little bit on the nose, but um, but yeah. Sorry, I I, I didn't realise who that was. So, I mean, that really made me groan. And now, knowing who they are, it makes me really yeah, groan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, that's horrible. You, you know, I always want to try and be a bit fair with stuff. And I mean, there, 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 yeah. there, there's some good points and some good people involved in this. I mean, first of all, from a behind the scenes perspective. Uh, we've talked on on previous podcasts when we did the John Landis one, for example, about the work of Rick Baker and uh, yeah. Rick Baker, who had obviously, you know, he'd been involved in the 76 King Kong remake for, for effects and things. Um, he did all of the animatronic and performance um, uh, 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 you know, guerrilla effects in this. Um, again, you know, we're talking sort of just pre just slightly pre the digital age so a lot of it was done practically with sort of forced perspective sets and um you know blue screen work and and some of the effects were finished off by ilm and uh, some of the other you know effects houses out there so again a, a very big budget film um terry leonard was was the stunt coordinator on this obviously he, along with uh, Glenn Randall and Vic Armstrong, had, had brought the Indiana Jones films to life from, from a stunts perspective. And uh, the score on this is actually rather good, done by the, the sadly, sadly now late James Horner. So, yeah. um, 
So, yeah. so you know, there's there isn't. It's not all bad. There's some there's some good stuff going on here uh, in terms of, of of the quality of the production and the quality of the filmmaking. Um, however, again, you know, back to, to to story and characters and tone and and things of that nature. Uh, this is kind of a little bit where it's let down. I mean, we've got some. Um, the setup is we've got this is an early film of for the uh, still gorgeous Charlize Theron. Um, she plays uh, Jill Young, uh, who, um, as a young girl growing up in in South Africa, uh, with her mother studying, you, you know, mountain gorillas, and um, uh, you, you know she becomes very close to uh, w w one of the gorillas in particular. Which uh, interesting bit of trivia: the the obviously the, all of the gorillas in this, if they weren't animatronic, then they were they were actors in suits at this at this stage. And the young uh, Joe Young, <laughs> the young Joe Young, there you go. But the Joe Young, the infant <laughs> Joe Young, uh, is actually played by Vern T Troyer, who is famous for playing Mini Me <laughs> in the Austin Powers <laughs> film. So there you go. Um, okay. so, I thought I recognised him. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You it was the, when he put the finger up to the the mouth. That's what did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and when one million dollars. Yeah. Uh, we had to go with that, didn't we? Um, but yeah, so a, 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 as a child, um, you, you, you know, they're, they're they're studying and at the, these mountain gorillas, which which are you know uh, in the wilds. When uh, you you know at, at poachers come um, again. Very, very moustache twirling, although a very good actor. It's played by, um, he's in so many films, but I never know how to pronounce his name. Ra Rade Sebedzia, I think. I don't know how it's pronounced. I, I think you've done a better job than I Yeah, ever he's a Croatian could. actor who's, who's, who appears in a lot of stuff. I mean, he really is a, a very good character. Actor. Why, I always remember him from Eyes Wide Shut. He's the owner of the costume um, shop that uh, Tom Cruise gets his uh, mask and cape There from. you go. We had to get some Kubrick in there, and we've done it. Oh, Yay! hell yeah. Honor, honor <laughs> should be honoured. There you go. Uh, so... I said, I mean, we talked Alien. We've talked <laughs> Kubrick. Hey, we've even talked Deliverance. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, that, that's the oddest link ever, I agree. Um, anyway, so, um, yes, th this these poachers turn up led by... Um, this guy uh, Strasser is, is his character name, and uh, they, they, you know, they, they basically, um, you, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to poach the the gorillas, and they they, uh, they 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 do kill a couple of the gorillas, and um, they they end up killing uh, Shelley Theron's um, mother in the story. Uh, but not, but, yeah. but not before the the young infant gorilla is actually able to uh, to bite the poacher's um, thumb and, and first finger off. So he's left with that. And then uh, essentially we jump forward uh, twelve years. Can I just stop you there? I just want to say I uh, that sequence where the poachers are killing the animals and um, Jill Young's mother gets shot. I have to say, it was a pig's ear of a scene because you just couldn't see anything. Yeah, it was so it was cut so quickly. Everything was in close ups. You you couldn't make out the where everybody out was was what was happening. Now I, you know, I guess it was kind of done because it's a Disney film, and you know we can't show innocent animals being shot. Uh, especially the mother. I mean, I didn't even realize the mother had been shot. Yeah, she sort of was just on the floor. I mean, it was just it, editing wise, it was. I know it felt butchered. Yeah, well, I mean, this is this is this is as my comment at the beginning. You know, I said I I feel slightly sort of bad in some respects picking this as movie hell because you you know in a in a lot of respects it's it's not a necessarily a bad movie. I I think the movie suffers very much because it is trying to be so family friendly and such a disney movie and i i, I mm. think i think this is kind of and you're exactly right that it has very very minimal violence in this film um and you know the subject matter 
um, you could have had a, a a darker, grittier, stronger, you know, more graphic um, style of directing and, and filmmaking. But obviously, you, you know, when you're talking about a ninety million dollar budget and and you know um, Disney being in control of of, of, of this property. Uh, then, then you know, this is what you get, I'm afraid. And um, as I said, it's it's not a bad movie, but it, it it just could be better. Though saying that, saying that, the one thing I thought was, you know, very sort of evil moustache twirling, <laughs> was um, one of um, Strata's lackeys sort of says, "Oh, the woman's been shot. Shouldn't we get her help?" And he's like, "No, we will leave now." And, you know, I thought that was really crude oh, yeah. and nasty. I thought, what? I mean, because you, you're, yes, you're a poacher, but you were there for the animals. So that was an accident. You shot that woman by mistake and, you know, you, you're not going to do anything. Sadly, it does really play on um, uh, cliche and stereotypes and predictability. And that's, again, another another problem with this is, is that, I mean, it is so sort of, you know, paint by numbers um, in terms of storytelling, and you're right. You get you get lost. The other the other big problem with this to make it understandable to a wide audience, uh, you've got a hell of a lot of you know things being described in in exposition and in dialogue, which yeah. which is quite obvious, and and that's right from the right from we you know we jumped twelve years on um, you know. Uh, Charlize Theron is now a you know a young woman, um, and enter Bill Paxton uh, in probably up to this point in his career one of the few films where he doesn't die. <laughs> I mean, he's not quite Sean Bean territory, but he was there with quite a lot of them, wasn't he? Um, I think Sean Bean stole his crown because <laughs> yeah. he was he was the guy that you know if you're going to have him in his film, you sort of you know he's going to die. You know, I mean the guy been killed by the term they had the predator and the alien exactly exactly so there, there you go but yeah and enter bill paxton he's playing um a uh, wildlife teacher who goes out to you know study animals but uh we've also got again in, in a bit of a sort of comic relief slightly cringeworthy role um naveen andrews pops up as as his guide in africa um, yeah and uh, yeah, it, it, it's you have this scene where you know everything's explained. Uh, you know, the first thing N- Naveen Andrews does is go over to the the gun that uh, Bill Paxton's got in the jeep and says, "Oh, uh, what 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 are in these these bullets?" And he goes, "Oh, they're tranquilizers. You know, I would never harm anything." And it's all you know, obviously set up to yeah. be absolutely you know foolproof story wise. Um, and they get in, and you know, we get into a, a reasonably well done action sequence where um, they 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 end up coming across uh, Joe that is now grown to a height of you know seventeen feet or whatever he's supposed to be in this. So he's a very very rare mountain gorilla to be of this size. Which we get exposition again saying that uh, one in every three or four generations you get one of these huge gorillas. Yes. And it's like okay, yeah, and this is this is slightly. I mean, I think this is more exaggerated than the uh, the, the 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 source material that it was based on. I didn't I didn't get a yeah. chance to. There is there is actually been released a very nice uh, Blu-ray disc for the 1948 uh, Mighty Joe Young, which is on my Amazon wish list, <laughs> which I'd like to get <laughs> because it's 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 you know it's a fully loaded Blu-ray and. Uh, it would go nice with my original King Kong that I've got here in the rack. So, uh, so, but anyway, back to this one. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so yeah. And I, by the way, I couldn't find a lot in terms of uh, behind the scenes or special features about this film. I mean, I managed to find just a vanilla disc with, with, with it on. Um, so, so, so yeah, so you've got Bill Paxton, you know, he is clearly set up as a, as a, as a good guy here. Uh, that that only means the best for for, for Joe, and um, you know continues his his pursuit uh, on his own to 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 collect more information about this. And this is where he stumbles across, you know, Jill Young, who who you know he's clearly got a thing for, even though he's like twenty years older than she is. But uh, hey, it's Hollywood, right? <laughs> um, and uh, you, you you know, 
she's very weary of him to start with, but uh, eventually, um, you know, he earns her trust. And at this point in the storyline, um, you, you know, because of more and more sightings of Joe, uh, more and more poachers, et cetera, have, have found out and, and have started to sort of come to that area to try and um, capture him. And, and obviously our, our moustache twirling bad guy <laughs> is of course, and killer of uh, Jill's mother is, is, is one of them. Um, yeah. So it, basically um, Bill Paxton's character uh, manages to persuade uh, Jill Young to to allow Joe to be brought back to the the US to Los Angeles, where there's a um, uh, a reserve where he can be, you know, looked after and treated well. And she actually agrees to this, sort of reluctantly, but a lot lot of it for um, you know, you know, for the safety of Joe. So they they yeah. transport him. Uh, across to to Los Angeles. So here we have, of course, Jill being the uh, the fish out of water. Um, you know, having having not grown up in the civilization of, of of then contemporary Los Angeles. So so we get a little bit of that happening. Um, and they get brought to the park. Now again, uh, one of one of Ron Underwood's alumni from City Slickers. We have uh, David Paymer again make an appearance. This time playing Harry Rubin, who's the director of the Animal Preserve in Los Angeles, and uh, is now, now that Naveen Andrews is, is, you know, still back in Africa, he then takes over as the uh, comic relief character for the, uh, for, 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 the, for the remainder of the film. Um, uh, he and who else? Uh, Regina King is also introduced here, playing uh, one of the doctors at, at the at the reserve so you know it starts off fairly fairly well that they, they they get moved across and um you, you know uh joe gets put into this habitat and you know everybody seems reasonably happy for for, for a moment here until of course this is tracked down by one of um Strasser's henchmen uh <laughs> In fact, I'm trying to remember what his henchman's name is. But... Well, this is played by uh, Peter Thurst. That's right. Uh, Garth is the guy's name. Garth. Yes. And it did it did seem to be a waste of uh, Peter Thurst. Tell the truth. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, this it... is this is before he did Spooks, but it's you know well after doing like Life Force and The Hunt for Red October. Yeah. So you know, it it, it just it, it did seem to be weird to see him in it and. You know, just sort of plain second fiddle. You know, he was like the henchman, uh, and it, it's kind of weird because uh, throughout it, he is very evil. You know, there has a, they have this bit where he's got these kind of bells and yeah, kind of chains. It's like his key. Well, no, it's 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 something that they use to rattle um, Mighty Joe Young. To That's get right. him upset. Well, he remembers it from when he was an infant, doesn't he? Because it's the yeah. same. Yeah. It's, it's the same uh, uh, as when it's he was... like a lure or something. Yeah. It's it's something that they used when they were poaching, and and so he does this, and he's he's very evil about it. But then near the end, he has a change of heart out of the blue. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, uh, what? Well, this is one of the things. I mean, this is, again, one of the problems is uh, many of the characters in this are so one dimensional that when you mm. do get a, a character shift, you know, in a change of heart like this, it is very jarring just because they have just been awful with with absolutely no sign of, of anything else. <laughs> leading up to that point and i mean yes he goes and he taunts joe uh he causes joe to you know throw a bit of a tantrum by uh by by as i said um winding him up basically and 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 he's yeah just just pure evil <laughs> for, for most of the movie yeah so joe crashes that party you talked about earlier yes yeah they the, have the a benefit one with the uh, the cameo exactly yeah. they have they have a um they they hold a uh, a fundraising for the for the uh, um, animal preserve. They uh, you know benefit a charity benefit uh, function, um, which of course we've got you know <laughs> Charlize Theron um, sort of uh, 
foreshadowing what she ends up doing for Chanel or whatever it is now <laughs> in a beautiful <laughs> black backless dress looking looking amazing um yeah. <laughs> and uh yeah i mean we have and we have great comic relief again from um uh, david paymer with him you know dropping cocktail sauce down down the front of his tuxedo and 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 just being a bit of a buffoon basically before his speech but then then we have this bit where uh, it is actually the one i guess the one bit of sort of graphic um gore that that you have in the film albeit very briefly where one of the innocent, um, uh, you, you know, people at the party gets their, you know, foot stomped on when when uh, Joe does this, uh, you know, rampage through the party and, uh, you know, injures several people in the process. And it's obviously this major low point for uh, for all of the characters at this stage when um, Joe then has to be put in a cage and is and is going to be. Uh, uh, you, you, you know, destined to spend the rest of his life in a cage uh, and becomes depressed and isn't eating. And this is a real problem and a low point for everyone. So uh, basically they get their heads together and they want to come up with this plan of how to get um, Joe, you know, back, back, back to his own country and, and back somewhere where he can roam free. Um so between them, they, they, they figure out a way to essentially break him out of prison. <laughs> uh, everybody comes on board to help, even even uh, David Paymer's character uh, who, who sets them up. And, you know, Joe is put aboard a, a, another transporter like the one he arrived. But dun, dun, dun. <laughs> when when Jill gets in, it is, in fact, <laughs> uh, stressed. Strazza, the, uh, the 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 yeah. bad guy, and his evil henchman. <laughs> let, let, let's let's back up a bit because I think people would think, wait a minute, what are those guys doing there? Are they they hijacking the truck? No, their their plan all the time was that uh, Strazza runs a his own preserve, where on on the outside it looks like they're doing really good work, but really they are evil, and there's you know, I mean cutting up animals and selling parts off and stuff and yeah just really horrible and so with the incident that happens at the party Strazza you know tells Jill Young about his reserve and how that you know that Joe would be happy there you know he comes across as a nice person and the thing is Jill does not remember him doesn't realize who he is and so she's very happy to to you know joe to go with them and hence why they're in the truck but of course she then spots his uh trigger finger and his thumb missing and then suddenly he remember she remembers who he yeah, is Yeah, i mean that was that was one <laughs> bit when, when when they met at the reserve the one bit and again i i put it down to the fact i think he's a very good actor anyway uh one bit they did do quite well is when she goes to uh to shake hands with him he he takes her hand with his with his left hand and uh, obviously totally yeah. foreshadowing and winking to the audience but uh, but i actually felt that you know as an actor he pulled that off quite convincingly and it and it seemed to sort of work in that moment so that wasn't That's so right, bad yeah. and of course without that we wouldn't have been able to have this reveal where she sees that his fingers are missing so yeah <laughs> And then we and then we get into Terry Leonard work big time, don't we? <laughs> well, yeah. This you then have uh, Joe Young rampaging through the sea. Well, but in a nice way. I mean, there's a whole bit where he moves uh, a car full of three teenagers out out of his way, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's it's very light. Yes. It's 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 kind of King Kong light, isn't it? This moment. <laughs> yeah. And then and then we get to the the final scene where he's in a in a, a fun fair and he causes all kinds of damage but uh, instead of the police shooting him they uh he he rescues a little boy from the top of the ferris wheel yeah this is where it gets very schmaltzy and uh sentimental oh, and kind of hell. very disney yes <laughs> they 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 do the thing where he rescues the boy but he falls down and we're not quite sure if he's alive or dead 
but we all know he's alive. You know, it wasn't that much of a fall, especially for an ape that size. And, um, you know, it's going to cost a lot of money to either transport him or do something. And, and it's him, a bit horrible. The little, the little boy says, I've got money and gives her like a dollar or something. And then everybody else starts going, yeah, I've got money. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it's horrible. It's horrible. And uh, obviously they must have raised the money yeah. for this little, you know, because they uh, they end up back in Africa again. Back in the same spot they were before. But now, now in its own reserve, yeah. And um, all those pesty poachers, they've all disappeared. Yeah, now I, I must admit, this is this is why I picked it as uh, as movie hell because um, yeah, the the end of this is 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 a is a letdown really. Um, it's it's all very, as I said, family friendly and predictable, and um, yeah, it just could have been just could have been a lot better. I think. Um, so yeah, and 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 there's not much more to say about that. I mean, it's a typical, no. it's a typical happy ending, Disney happy ending, but not in the same way as they he did City Slickers, which which kind of you, you know did it with a certain amount of um, style and whatever. This was this was quite sort of cheesy and predictable and. Um, yeah, it just kind of it was it's actually cringeworthy. The bit with the with the dollars, uh, you, you know, and I, 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 here you can have a dollar, and they all did it, which just kind of it just made you want to. Uh, well, it made me groan. I have to say. <laughs> yeah, it, it made me want to throw up a little bit. <laughs> uh, the thing about City Slickers, Slickers and Tremors is, is it sets the story up really well, and then it pays off it really earns those endings where this it kind of like was just a collection of things that happened and didn't you know it just seemed to move very quickly i mean the bit where she decides to move joe from africa to america was so quick mm -hmm. she you know she gave it a little bit of thought but it just it happened so quickly and also slightly confusing in places as well I, I was thinking back to the beginning where you see her as a little girl and they're at the funeral and she runs off into the jungle and i thought from that point on that she was living out in the jungle with joe you know because she had made a promise to look after joe to her mum, and so i i thought she was like going to be like a like a tarzan character or mm -hmm. something somebody who you know been brought up in the wild with the but no no she'd been living in town and all this stuff and it's just like oh okay what yeah, yeah. <laughs> what happened there yeah so yeah it's just it was it was very confusing it was moved along very quickly you know i think a lot of it it felt like people were just it, it didn't seem to be kind of any sort of I don't know, joy to No, it. no, I know. What you... it's, it just seems, it feel like people were doing it for the patient. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, things like Joe himself was very well done. I mean, I think, I think mm. the, uh, the, the, the special effects, um, you, you, you know, really work and, and, you know, there aren't too, oh, there God, aren't, he's the best thing in yeah, the film. There aren't, there aren't too many <laughs> bits where it's like, oh, they're not quite looking in the right place or whatever. You know, most of it's, most of it's done fairly well, uh, most of the compositing and, and, and things of that nature. Um, you, you know, the action in it is, is good, although, again, it's, it's, it's kind of A-team action in the way that, uh, you, you know, nobody yeah. actually gets hurt uh, in any of this. Yes. Um, I mean, it is surprising. it's almost surprising, actually, that the, the evil villain does actually die in in the end it's yes like, wow they actually went there they, there's so many things that they didn't go there on but uh they do actually um kill off the villain who is obviously so nasty and has no redemption whatsoever uh, <laughs> but uh uh but other than that it, 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 it is way you know i think that's what it suffers from is it's not necessarily a badly made film but you know the script is very pointing it's very predictable and um yeah you, you know you know every, everything's done to 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 you know be incredibly family friendly incredibly pg um and 
very dull. Yeah, a bit dull. Very it's, dull. It's, film. it's not. It's not yeah. great. It's not something. As I said, I'd never bothered watching it. You, you know, since I saw it, I guess I saw this one at the, the theater. I'm guessing. I don't really remember. There you go. <laughs> and uh, you, you, you know, I watched it this time, and it was kind of like, ah, uh, yeah. And I sort of thought, you know, part of me sort of thinks, ah, oh, I feel kind of bad for picking this, you know, because because it's well made and whatever. But you're absolutely right. It's dull and it doesn't really work. And um, yeah, yeah, it's 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 not a great film of his. So. Uh, there you go, movie hell. Watch the watch the original. You're going to watch Mighty Joe Young. Watch the 1948 <laughs> film with the wonderful That's Ray it. Harryhausen stop animation in it. Very good <laughs> for its time, anyway. <laughs> well, anyway, I think uh, that's a good place to finish. Yeah. Um. So we're going to end on our. Uh, customary fashion and so keith where can we find your work yeah if you want to look at anything i've done if you go to youtube and put in british isles spell e-y-l-e-s um there are short films that i've made there that you can uh, view and please feel free to uh, to comment share you know whatever that would be great thank you and of course you can find my work on uh, independentrunnings.com uh, you can listen to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Mixcloud, and YouTube. And uh, you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Just search Movie Heaven, Movie Hell. So, uh, <laughs> that brings us to the end to another episode. And uh, hopefully you will join us for the next one. See ya. <laughs>